Why don't you take a minute to greet the people around you, and we'll get started in just a second. Check. There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Spring Mountain Bible Church. Uh, as we begin to take our seats, if you are new here, we encourage you to look in front of your seat. There should be a little blue card that you can fill out to give us your email address. And uh, also, if you have any prayer requests or needs, just let us know. You can put in that little note, and you can put those in the back. And the, there's some blue box, uh, some uh, wood boxes in the back as you leave the church. You can stick those in there. Or just leave it on this little banister thing in the back. And that's a great way to get connected to our body and to uh, um, see what's going on. There's an email that goes out, I think, almost daily here. And it has a lot of information about what um, activities are going on, different Bible studies, and things like that. So if you would like to get connected to our body, I encourage you to fill out that blue card and uh, give us your email. And we can get you on the list and we can be um, connected. If you'd like to give to the ministry of uh, Spring Mountain Bible Church, uh, out on our website, there's a PayPal thing that you can click, and that can work. And also there are some wood boxes on the back out there that um, uh, you can put uh, your giving in there. So this week we're going to be talking, we're going into the book of John. I'm really, really excited about this. And as I have been preparing for this, I've been looking at uh, Matthew, and the book of John. I'm in Matthew right now. Um, but there was a passage that came across, and I just want to share it real quick with you. It's uh, Matthew 25 and 30, 37, or 34 through 40. It says, And the king will say to those on, on his right, Come, you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did you see? When did we see you, a stranger, invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you, a sick in prison, and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so I just love that picture of God saying that the things that the righteous didn't even know they were doing. I mean, they, they didn't bring it right to their minds. And God is just saying, You did this for me, and that's the reward in heaven. And so as we think about all the things that life is pulling us for and all the different um, tax on our time, uh, just to kind of remember that, that there are opportunities to serve God in little ways that may not seem really important here, but in heaven have an eternal significance. So with that, there are things that you can get involved with over the next couple of weeks. Uh, one I know is on March 16th, we're going to have an Easter event here for the kids, age 0 to 12. I don't see Wendy here anywhere. Okay, um, but um, Wendy, our children's uh, minister, ministry leader, she can um, talk to you about that. But I uh, believe what they asked for was they want like snacks, kid, kid snacks, so like things like Cheez-Its and goldfish and pretzels, which happen to be all my favorite snacks too, so it's kind of fun. Um, anyways, they were, they're asking folks to bring, to uh, let them know if they'll, they'll be able to bring some of those things. And I think it's next week they were asking us to have those available. Is that right? So bring them next week, and that would be some of the food the kids would be able to partake in um, on the 16th. Um, also, I don't see Amy Anderson here either, and that's the other announcement that I had on my list for a paint party. So again, go look at the email address. It's really interesting. I'm not sure. Is this for the women's retreat? Yes, this is for the women's retreat as well. 
So they're doing some decorations, and the women's retreat is the end of April. Uh, so they're doing some preparations for that. And uh, if you have any sort of painting skills or would like to join them at her house to do some uh, prep work for the um, stuff going on there, uh, she has some information on that. So let's go ahead and take these things to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for letting us be able to come here as a body to worship you, to hear your word. God, I'm so excited to see what you have uh, for us today as we begin this journey in the book of John. I uh, pray, God, you be with Steve as he gives us your word, that you would encourage him. You would give him just um, words of wisdom, uh, words to uh, draw us on closer to you. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.
Good morning. It's good to see all your uh, smiling faces and uh, those that aren't. <coughs> so uh, this morning we're going to be doing the, or I'm going to be putting forth the introduction to the Gospel of John. Now, it's funny because when we were first talking about doing this gospel, uh, the elders were talking about it and said, it's like, maybe you should just skip the introduction. You should just go right into the, right into the, uh, you know, the book itself because introductions can be so boring. And, uh, you know, it's like you kind of lose your momentum before you even get started. And I was totally on board with that. But then I started reading in preparation for this preaching series. And the more I read, it's like, wow, this is, there's so many cool things about John. And if we just preach through it, no one's going to even be aware of these things. So, um, so maybe it'll still be boring. But it was exciting for me. So there you have it. Um, I'm going to give this a shot this morning. Keep it simple, stupid. So that's our series, That You Might Believe, A Journey Through the Gospel of John. And um, I don't know how this is even going to work, frankly. Let me put this up there. And uh, yeah, like I said, that's the, uh, the introduction. I'm so sorry. I, I'm not a great, uh, a great PowerPoint person, but I wanted to have something that for those who, you know, enjoy seeing something, Maybe you get something out of that. But um, before we get started, why don't we clo- I mean, uh, open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be called by your name, to be your children, to, be, um, to have the opportunity, Lord, to look into your word and to see what you have for us there. And I just pray, Lord, this morning as we get going um, on, this, on this series that you, your hand of blessing, Lord, would be upon us. I pray, Father, that you would fill me with your spirit, that you speak through me. And um, just even though there might be some things that, that are more than nuts and bolts, that, uh, that yet you would be glorified and the body of Christ would be built up. And so we just ask these things, Lord, in Christ's name, amen. So, to begin with, why four Gospels? You ever thought about that? It's like, why not one Gospel? Um, and why the book of John? What's, what's, what's with that? Because it's so much different than, than the other four. Matter of fact, the first three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels. Kind of like you're all getting a, a similar picture of what's going on. But in reality, there, even though there's four Gospels, there's actually only one Gospel, right? It's the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And, um, and in that Gospel, we have four different perspectives looking at the same thing. Now, I don't know how many of you might be familiar with this, this movie. It's a while back, but it's called Vantage Point. It uh, starred Dennis Quaid. It's very interesting. It's a thriller about a, uh, a, a terrorist attack. And what it does is that it takes the same story from different um, characters' perspective, and you, you're going through the story again and again, and you start seeing all these different facets it's like you had no idea. It almost looks like a different story, but it's the very same story, and that's in essence what we have here with the Gospels. Now, in Matthew, is written primarily to the Jews, and Jesus is displayed as the, the Jews' Messiah and their king. And what do you do with the king? Well, you bend the knee to him. You worship him. Secondly, Mark, written first to the Romans, it's interesting, Romans were those people that's like, you know, doers, get her done, get her done. I mean, you know, discipline, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in this book, the word immediately, euthus, uh, is used 41 times. It's like, I don't know, three times more than, than the other gospels put together. And so you have this, Jesus is getting it done. He's going from place to place, you know, immediately he does this, immediately he does, does that. And here Jesus is depicted as the servant, and we're called to follow him. And in Luke, which is written to the common Greeks, um, Jesus is 
is displayed as the perfect man, the Son of Man. And we're called to imitate him. And then lastly, John, written to the Hellenistic Jews of the Diaspora, those that had been taken into captivity and then been spread out through Asia Minor. And also to all those who received him, as it says in John uh, chapter 1, verse 12. So not just them, but, but us as well, even, even in this day and age. And there Jesus is displayed as fully God, but in human flesh. And what are we supposed to do? We're called to believe in him. Now, I like what Clement of Alexandria, he's one of the early church fathers, had to say. He said, last of all, John, perceiving that the external facts had been made plain in the gospel, that is the three synoptics, being urged by his friends and inspired by the Spirit, composed a spiritual gospel. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea here. I think these days you hear of a spiritual gospel. That kind of maybe implies like a made-up gospel, right? It's like lots of imagery, allegory. Um, it's not really true, but it, it, gets a, it gets a point across. It's got a good, good point to it. That's not what he's saying at all. He's referring to the spiritual gospel. Again, it's because it's so unique. It has this theological depth to it that you don't see in the others. Every one of those gospels has a beautiful picture of Christ. And we see so much going on. But here, there's, there's something different. We see the inner workings of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the, of the eternal Godhead. There's a heavenly perspective to the Gospel of John in a special way that's not seen elsewhere. Now, as we move on, there's some basic questions that uh, you might be curious about. First of all, who is it that wrote the book? Well, I've already told you it's John, right? Obvious. Well, some people dispute that. They say, well, John's nowhere named in in the this gospel, so it must not be John. But no, it's it's John. It'd be no different than to be reading a novel by uh, John Grisham or or James Michener or someone like that, and uh, you know you see their name on the front, ti- on, you know, th- the title page, if you will, or the, or the cover of the book, and then you open up the story and you're reading, you don't find their name anywhere in the story. Well, it must not have been written by them. No, it was written by them, but it, you know, it's not focused on them. And I think here, John, in the same way, is, is taking the focus off himself. Matter of fact, it's funny, is that as you go through this gospel, he doesn't even mention his name at all. It's just he talks about a certain disciple. Or one of the things that I love is six times he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loves. So who is John? Well, we're told that he's the son of Zebedee. We're told he's a fisherman. We're told that he and his brother, John John and James, James and John, got the, the nickname of Sons of Thunder. We know elsewhere that that John was the one who, when he saw somebody um, casting out demons uh, in Jesus' name, that he told him to stop, knock that off, and that Jesus had to rebuke him for that. Another time, he and James, it's like when, when, uh, when they were marching up toward Jerusalem and they were going to stop into a village, the village didn't want him to come, come in. And so what did James and John do? They wanted to call down fire from heaven and just destroy the village. Now, that sounds like sons of thunder uh, to me. So, you know, but I want to just think about for a moment, John himself, I want you to picture this, is that John, early on, we find out in this book, we get strong hints that he was a disciple of John the Baptist. So clearly, he, you know, it's like he was in, in for adventure, right? He was in for adventure, and he was going to sign up for, for, for this rogue prophet that was out there eating, uh, what was it he eating? He's eating um, locusts and wild honey. So this is the guy that John is following around. And then one day, Jesus comes by, and John mentions that it's Jesus, the Messiah, and John immediately shifts gears. 
and starts going, but Jesus, Jesus, where are you staying? So immediately wanting to follow Jesus. But you think about over John's life, all the things that are going on, some of which that we learn within this book, is I, I picture him in many ways like uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, where it says that he treasured up, she treasured up all these things in her heart. And that's what John was doing. He was treasuring up all these things, all these experiences. And yet, and yet, uh, I don't know why he couldn't bring himself to write, write about it. Maybe because he felt so unworthy. You know, he had heard John the Baptist say, oh, this man here, I mean, his sandals, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And I think that that is what, uh, how John felt. Matter of fact, some people think when, when, when John refers to himself as the, the disciple that, that Jesus loved, that's like, well, that's being arrogant. You know, it's like John, John thinks pretty highly of himself. Oh, yeah, I'm the one that Jesus loved. But in reality, what I believe it was, was it was a, a, a term of endearment, but a term of humility. He couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that Jesus Loved him. Secondly, when was it written? Well, it's the last gospel written, in all likelihood, from everything that we see. The other gospels were probably all written around the 50s or 60s. His was written later, and most everybody agrees it was written after the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, interestingly enough, as I've been going through studying, preparing, it seems to be coming uh, more strongly believed among uh, conservative scholars that perhaps this book wasn't even written until after he'd written 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, after he wrote Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, and after Domitian had died and he had been gotten out of his, um, his uh, not captivity, but his, what am I looking for here? Exile, thank you. See, somebody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, and that he was back at the church of Ephesus, and it was there that he wrote this. Who is it written to? Well, likely the Jews of the Diaspora in Asia Minor, plus Gentiles, I mentioned before. There are clues here where he uses the word Jew or Jews 70 times, and it's interesting because in multiple locations, he uh, Greek terms are translated into Aramaic, which is an indicator of perhaps the Jews of the Diaspora which are those, again, were taken into captivity and then were, were uh, living in different parts of Asia Minor. And, um, and why did John write it? Well, this is interesting. This is the thing that gets us all excited about this book, those of us who knew it, is that it's evangelistic, unapologetically evangelistic. Rarely is a theme so clearly spelled out John 20, 30 and 31, we read these words. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Why was it written? so that we might believe and that by believing we may have life in his name. So, did I just turn that off? Yep, okay. So what's so unique about John? I think I missed one off here. Oh, there we go, okay. There's a number of things that are really unique about John. This is where I started getting excited. And again, I look at this and I say, Okay, another introduction, and uh, lots of Bible trivia, but I think it's pretty cool Bible trivia, so. Um, number one, scholars say 80 to 90% of the material is John's alone. That, that's a pre pretty big amount of material. Of the eight miracles record, recorded, only two are found in any other gospel. There are no childhood stories, no testing in the desert, no parables, no exorcisms, no transfiguration, no ascension to heaven, and I could go on and on. There's 
just interesting. It's written with the most basic vocabulary words and grammar, but with unparalleled depth of meaning. It's fascinating because almost, if you will, the book of John was the original um, New Living Bible or the Living Bible, right? Because even when he speaks of Jesus, Jesus uses very simple words. It's like John's using his own vocabulary, you know, that of, that of a fisherman to, to, to state what Jesus said. And as I like to think about, um, uh, as is often said when it comes to, to uh, translations that use dynamic equivalency, is the king's message, even if it's in a different language or spoken by someone else, else in different words, is still the king's message. And, uh, and clearly, that's the case here. In the book of John, we get behind the scene looks at Jesus' ministry. It, this is one of the in, most intimate things. It's like he, he, um, he does a miracle or a sign, as it's referred to here. He does a miracle or, or he does a discourse. Um, but then afterwards, we see him where he, he's alongside somebody individually and he's talking with them privately. And we get to listen in on that. We get to be, we get to be that fly on the wall that gets to listen in to what's going on there. You know, it's interesting, speaking of that, I, one of the things that seems to be a common thread, I think, all the time when it comes to Bible, Bible books, it's like, well, did John use Luke or did he use Mark as his source material for this book? Well, I would say neither. How bizarre that the, that, that, the, that the disciple of Jesus who writes that the Holy Spirit is going to come and that he's going to lead us into all truth and that he'll bring to your mind everything that I've said to you is then has to go and pull source material from, from somewhere else. Oh no, all these years, even on that Isle of Patmos, most likely John was meditating, thinking back, pondering all the things that Jesus had done. And he was just, he was filled to overflowing. And think of him talking about, the, about Jesus giving the Holy Spirit. It's like a, a, a spring of living water that wells up within you to eternal life. And I kind of picture that going on within John as he's thinking about all these things in Jesus. And speaking of that, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our center stage in this book. Unlike any of the other epistles, we get a witness um, intimate insights into the Father and the relationship between Jesus and between the Father and between the, the, the Spirit and the Son and the Father. We get to see all these things in a way that the others do not. I'm so thankful that this fourth gospel was written. Matter of fact, John uses Father 137 times, more than twice that of the synoptics. And 122 times, it refers specifically to God the Father. If anything, you know, we, we say the, 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 uh, the Lord's Prayer from the Sermon on the Mount, which isn't here, our Father who art in heaven, how be your name. But most people believe, in, you know, that are, that are writing about these things, that in all likelihood, our are coming to that point to where we just refer to God as Father was probably directly the result of John's tender, tender portrayal of the Father in this book. Also, we have the word believe. It occurs 98 times, multiple times in every chapter. Matter of fact, it's even been coined the gospel of belief. Matter of fact, I believe that our own uh, Al Bayless, Dr. Bayless, to those of you who are students under him, <laughs> um, uses that term, the gospel of belief. So what is this belief that we're talking about? It's not just accepting it as truth, right? Oh, it's true, I, I agree to the facts. Or, you know, acknowledging that Jesus, yeah, Jesus is, is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Yeah, I, I, I believe that. Um, yeah, not just the facts, but 
it is, it is talking about believing biblically. And I think that there's nothing that perhaps uh, spells this out better than Charles Swindoll when he writes, when I say I believe in Jesus Christ, I declare that I trust him. I rely on him. I have placed my complete confidence in him. Everything I know about his life, this life, and whatever occurs after death is dependent upon his claims about himself and how I respond to his offer of grace. Here is how I respond. I believe in Jesus Christ. So powerful. I really love Dr. Swindoll. Had such a powerful ministry all over the, over the years. Now, talking about the unique things of John, there's also some other uh, thing that's unique. Even the very structure of the gospel is unique. It starts off with the prologue, which is chapter 1, 1 through 18. Right off the, out of the gate, you know, we have, we have other gospels where, you know, you, you, you hear about, you, know, you learn the genealogy and how, oh, well, Jesus is, is actually connected gene, genealogically to David, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have those things. We have some childhood, childhood uh, stories that we encounter, whatever. John, no, no. Straight out of the gate, right? Straight out of the gate. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So that kind of declaration right out of the gate again that Jesus is the preexistent, now incarnate Word of God. God in human flesh. So that's the prologue. And then we have his public ministry. Now it's interesting, when you look at this book, this long book, and you notice here, if you look at the public ministry and the private ministry, we have about you know half the book focused on his public ministry that takes over a period of three years. And then you have the last, I wouldn't really call it half, maybe third half of the book, is focused on four days. It's so, so that's kind of an interesting thing too. Now, his public ministry, we have his public miracles and teaching. Again, that he refers to as signs. Signs, which are, what does a sign do? When you, when you see a sign, what is, what, what is, what's a sign for? Pardon? That's right. It points to something. Exactly. It points to something. It says, hey, pay attention. This is, this is it. This is the way you go or whatever. And so John has these signs to point us to Jesus. But we also have, again, those private teachable moments where we get to listen in. And then we have his private ministry, chapters 13 through 20, four days. There, it's sometimes called the book of glory. I don't know why. I guess ultimately because God is glorified through the Son and he's glorified through, through his, um, his being lifted up on the cross so that all might come to him and then being resurrected from the dead. Um, but there we see his intimate teaching and fellowship with his disciples. We have the, the upper room discourse. We have the washing of, of, the, of the disciples' feet. Um, matter of fact, that's another thing that only occurs in the book of John. We have his trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. And then we have that interesting little appearance that he makes to the disciples in the upper room. And, uh, and Thomas wasn't there, and he doesn't believe the rest of them. He said, I'm not going to believe this unless, unless uh, I am you know, able to, to uh, touch his hands and stick my hand in his side. I'm not going to believe. And so then Jesus shows up, and, uh, and Thomas is like, oh, my Lord, my God, wow. And then finally, we have the epilogue, which is chapter 21. It's interesting. If we didn't have this, some people go, oh, well, that wasn't there originally. Who knows? Maybe John, maybe John added that later. But without it, we wouldn't have gotten the reinstatement of Peter, of Jesus saying, do you love me? And, Jesus, and, and Peter responding, I, you know I love you, Lord. Powerful stuff. So we have seven miraculous public signs, changing water into wine, healing the royal official's son, healing the lame man, feeding the 5,000, walking on the Sea of Galilee, healing the man blind from birth, raising Lazarus from the dead. Uh, all of these, only two of them occur 
in the other Gospels. One of them occurs in all of them, which is the feeding of the 5,000. But here it's interesting because you have the feeding of the 5,000, but then from that, it's like the background for Jesus' bold statement, I am the bread of life. So it launches into that, this public discourse. And also we have, and actually we have an eighth miracle, but they're not typically referred to as a sign. Um, and that is and that is the uh, second great catch of fish. And then we also have seven witnesses who testify. Look at those, John the Baptist. I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. All of these, the intent of all of these is to get us to realize this is evidence, these are signs, all of them that are pointing to Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Son of God, and to get us to put our faith in him. Jesus' own works and miracles, God the Father, the Old Testament scriptures, all of these are, are marshaled out as witnesses. Jesus' own testimony, the Holy Spirit, many of Jesus' followers. Matter of fact, i do this again. I don't know if I keep bumping it. Matter of fact, listen to these. Andrew. We have found the Messiah, Nathaniel. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. The Samaritans, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Peter, we believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Martha, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who was to come into the world. We also have... Other things that he brings out, he, the, the, the seven great I am statements. Again, more, uh, more Bible trivia, but important Bible trivia. Think of this. These don't occur elsewhere either. These don't occur in, in, in the other uh, Gospels. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Every one of these just dripping with spiritual depth, with intimacy, displaying who Jesus is, plus his declaration <clears throat> to the Pharisees when they were questioning him. And he says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. And it says at that point, they picked up stones to stone him. So, I also like other things about this book. This is where maybe, you know, the preacher in me starts coming out. But I love, there are questions that are asked in this book. One of them is for the man that's at the pool of Bethesda. He's been lame for 38 years. And uh, Jesus comes up to him and he says, you know, what's, what, why, have, why aren't you healed? Why haven't you gotten, you know, what's going on? And, and the man says, well, you know, there's no one helped me in the pool. And then Jesus asks this very direct question. He says, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Now that has implications for us too. You know, maybe we have an impediment in our life. Maybe we have something that, that, that is going on within our, our own lives that, that in reality is, is hindering us from being all that God desires for us to be. And that question Jesus asked us, do you want to get well? Or how about the, the uh, disciples' question about the blind man? Who sinned, right? The man born blind from birth. Who sinned, this man or his parents? That was a common belief back then, common belief today. And Jesus said, neither. But this was so that God might be glorified in his life. You know, as we're embarking on this, this journey into the book of John, Is that, do some of you out there, does that resonate with you? Perhaps you feel like, like life is not a bowl of cherries for you. 
You weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. And maybe you have some serious hindrances in your life. And maybe they've dogged you your entire life. And yet, and you're wrestling with, it's like, was it me? Was it something that, it, was it something that I've done? Well, we do have to examine ourselves. But maybe the answer is, is that God wants to be glorified in your life. Um, I think of Peter. Now, I realize this is the book of John, but Peter's probably my favorite, my, my favorite um, uh, character in Gospels in general and through, certainly in this book. Because, you know, he's, he's always gung-ho. He's always ready to, to step in and do what needs to be done and uh, just, just passionate. But it's interesting because after, after following Jesus and, and coming to that, that um, conviction that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, we have this setting in which Jesus is proclaiming himself to be the bread of life. But as, as he goes on, his discourse takes a turn in a direction that is not socially acceptable. Matter of fact, it's downright offensive. And that's when he says, I tell you the truth, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no life in you. And people immediately responded with, this is a hard saying. This is a hard saying. And it says many of his disciples left, left, left him. And then Jesus asked the question of the disciples, are you, are you going to go too? Now, what were going through the disciples' mind? They didn't even fully understand this. Maybe some of them were kind of thinking, maybe we should. This guy really sounds, I mean, what's he talking about here? The early Romans thought that, thought that Christians were cannibals because it had been so warped, right? So warped. In the Roman media, whatever, I don't know. But Jesus, I mean, but, but, but uh, in the midst of this, Peter says, where else can we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? So even though with all of his own doubts and struggles, where else can we go? Maybe he was feeling a little... Um, disillusioned at that point by Jesus. But then over time, over time, as his confidence builds, what do we have? We have him saying, you know, well, first of all, it's like you're never going to wash me. And then when Jesus says, well, unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. Oh, well, then wash my, my hands and my head as well. But beyond that, we have when he's going up to Jerusalem. And it's like, hey, even if all the others betray you, Lord, I'll never betray you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm willing to die for you. It's like he puts it all out there. And then Jesus responds, well, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to, respond, you're, you're going to deny me. I mean, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. There we go. So, and then that happens, and that happens. Now, in the same way that maybe he was disillusioned in some way by Jesus, now, after that happens, what ha picture this. He's, he's lost all his confidence. He feels so, so weighted down because he knows he's denied you. And he did it in public, no less. And so when Jesus is raised from the dead, even when he appears to them in the upper room, I think Peter is still thinking, it's over for me. Things will never be the same. My relationship with the Lord will never be the same. Have any of you felt like that?
to the point to where it's like maybe the Lord's called you to something, I don't know. And you say, what's the point? Maybe it's the mission field. Maybe it's preaching. Maybe it's a particular, whatever it might be that he's called you to. And just in general, to your Christian life, being the head of your family and, and raising up your family to love the Lord. And it's like, what's the point? I'm sure Jesus is done with me. It'll never be the same. I mean, even if we're on talking terms, we're never going to be best buds again. And so what does Peter do? Even after being Jesus appearing to them in, in the upper room, he says to the other disciples, let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. I think that's very significant. Because remember, he was originally called from fishing. And as a matter of fact, we learn from the other Gospels that the, the great catch of fish, the first great catch of fish, was when he was called to follow the Lord. And so they're out there fishing, and they fish all night, and they don't get anything. And then there's this man on the shore, and he, and, and he says, hey, you caught any fish? No, nope, it's been, you know, a bummer of a night. Well, hey, throw your nuts on the other side of the boat. And they, they have a net full of fish that they can barely haul in. And John immediately, John seems to be the sharp one in the group. He's also the fastest runner we know because he got to the tomb, um, inside the tomb first. There seems to be a little bit of competitiveness there. But anyway, he says, he says, it's the Lord. And immediately Peter jumps off the boat and, and, and uh, swims to shore. And then it's during that time where Jesus again, three times, in the same way that he denied him three times, he asks him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he reinstates them. Now that is something too, that maybe there's someone here that will be able to um, take that message to heart. That Jesus is always there. He's always willing to forgive. You know, nothing says that better than, than the woman at the well or the woman taken in adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So as we embark on this, uh, on this journey, I'm excited to see what the Lord has for us there. And I'm also trying to figure out so some thoughts to keep in mind as we embark on this trip. I think of my wife, Nancy, when we went to, uh, when we went to uh, uh, Disneyland and uh, Universal Studios. She was kind of like our in-house travel guide. I mean, not to put down, you know, Vicky Justice or anything. But, um, but, you know, the trip wouldn't have been nearly as fun if she hadn't, hadn't figured all the different connections out and all the best places to go and see and everything, um, I would have just shown up and just, it's like, okay, what do we do now? And I probably would have missed half of, half of the stuff that everybody would say, oh, you've got to see this. So in some way, that's kind of what I've been trying to do this morning. It's like, there's lots of great stuff in here, people. You got to see this. So as we, as we embark on this journey, this odyssey into the book of John, here's just a few thoughts. No matter how many times you've heard the stories and discourses from John, there's always another layer to unwrap, another avenue to venture down. God's word is never boring. It's called a spiritual gospel for a reason. God will speak to you powerfully through, this, through his word. And then this series is a long one, but don't lose sight of the forest because of the trees. Our, our passages, if you'll start seeing, are pretty short, some of them. Some are only a couple verses. One is, I'm looking forward to it, probably a year and a half down the road, is Trent's going to be preaching on Pilate's question, what is truth? You look forward to that. Matter of fact, he's preaching next week, too, so be praying for him. And then as mentioned earlier, the Gospel of John is evangelistic evangelistic. Be praying about who the Lord might want you to invite to hear one of 
the messages. And then I also want to note, I don't want you to think, well, this is just evangelistic, so it has nothing to do you know, for me, is that as I already illustrated from some of those uh, vignettes, if you will, um, is that Jesus wants to speak to you and to me each week. Not only does the book, is it meant for the pre-saved, pre-saved, but for those who already have life. He wants us, those of us who have it, to have it to the full, or as the King James says, more abundantly. So, in closing, I would, uh, you're one, if you're wondering, hey, is there going to be a, uh, a, uh, um, a congregational memory passage? There is. And no, you won't be saying it for two years or whatever. <laughs> but, but for right now, we chose this one as what we believe is probably um, the epitome as the theme of this book for uh for us to uh to, to start with so if you could all stand with me and let's say this together jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book but these are written that you may believe that jesus is the messiah the son of god and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are just, again, just in awe of your word. Um, we're in awe of both the simplicity and the depth, Lord, of, of the Gospel of John. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to spend some time in it together and to be able to meet you in a very special way. And uh, we just pray, Lord God, that as we move forward now, that your hand of blessing would be upon this preaching series, that you'd be with each one of those who will be speaking. We pray, Lord, for the congregation, that you'd be moving in the hearts of, of each and every individual, uh, drawing them to yourself. For those who do not yet know you, Lord God, we pray that they would come face-to-face, -face, a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, sins of the world. We pray, Lord God, for those who do know you, that they would renew, renew their relationship with you, grow closer to you. And so we just ask you, ask these things, Lord, in your son's precious name. We ask that you be glorified in all this. In Christ's name, amen. about the book of Luke and Steve said that John calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved and I think it really represents that intimacy that he has with the father that he has with Jesus their close-knit relationship that they have and every Sunday when we come back we get to kind of reflect on our life and how we did and our intimacy with the Lord and so this song is really just a reflection song to look at your life and say how am I doing with my intimacy with the Lord this morning Oh, yeah.
to Jesus I surrender may be saved announcement. Uh, Barb just told me also that there's not going to be ladies Bible stuff for the next two weeks. Is that correct? Because Barb will be out of town. So thank you, Steve and worship team. Um, I'm really excited about the book of John too. It's just got some really cool verses in it.
stand up and come up the, the middle side aisles and then come back to your seats. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, we invite you to come up and take communion with us.